lecture uh, I am going to spend some time uh, on the modeling and simulation aspects of distillation systems. If I were to go through complete modeling aspects uh, of a typical distillation system, uh, there are various issues which should be touched upon and the key issues I have written on this slide. Uh, we certainly need to understand distillation as a separation process, get into the theory of distillation because the rigor of model depends upon how good is the understanding of the process. We should also try to understand uh, distillation as a separation process from thermodynamic viewpoint, uh, how efficient or how inefficient the process can be because that will tell us what are the limiting factors and whether the designs could be uh, accordingly improved. Modeling also uh, has to take into account the configurational aspects because uh, distillation columns or distillation system systems operating in uh, different sectors may have different configurations. Uh, petroleum columns have a very different uh, uh, configurations as compared to uh, typical columns which you will find in the petrochemical industry or other chemical industry. Then uh, various uh, simulation and design issues we, we will touch upon. Obviously, the performance of a column uh, and also the design depends uh, a lot on uh, the choice of internals uh, which in turn govern the heat and mass transfer aspects. So, we need to understand that to some extent and of course, the energy analysis. Now, this is a very uh, ambitious list and one cannot do justice in uh, two 90 minute talks to cover all the details, but I will touch upon uh, most of uh, these items and get more into the simulation and design aspects. So, I am going to start uh, this presentation uh, by going through uh, these important facts about uh, distillation which we need to remember and uh, the aspect of simulation as well. Distillation columns and related operations constitute a significant fraction of the capital investment and the operating costs, which is a very true statement if you are working with processes which are essentially fluid handling processes. So, any industry, any process industry in which fluid handling dominates and examples could be refineries, petrochemicals you will find that by and large the uh, workhorse for separation is the process of distillation. Of course, this would not be true if uh, uh, the industry uh, uh, is from a sector where solid handling operations are dominating and very little fluid handling is done. Uh, so, distillation columns may not be encountered that frequently and uh, take for example, fertilizer industry. In fertilizer industry, uh, there are very few separations which are done by distillation, but uh, petrochemicals uh, where you are producing organic solvents or uh, feed stocks for uh, polymerization, uh, olefins etcetera, uh, after the cracking occurs. Uh, the separations are typically done by distillation systems. Now, I must go through uh, some very basic aspects of distillation to impress upon that distillation is a very energy intense process and therefore, in addition to the scope which exists for improvement in designs from other angles from hydrodynamics angle or let us say from structural angle or from controls viewpoint, 
energy plays a very significant role. So, we will have to spend some time uh, to look into these issues. So, I have written these three aspects the design problems, the energy integration problems and the control problems. In this particular talk we are only focusing attention on the design problems. We have a separate lecture on uh, distillation control and yet another separate lecture on energy integration or process integration. So, I am not touching upon those issues in this particular talk. Now, when we talk about design problems or when we talk about energy integration problems or even uh, 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 let us say design of control systems uh, last uh, several decades uh, people have been working on uh, mathematical models and it has been found that rigorous models become very useful tools for uh, solving variety of problems whether they are uh, simulation problems, whether they are design problems, whether they are optimization problems and so on and so forth. So, let us uh, go through some very basic material. Uh, this is so basic that sometimes people get offended by this type of presentation at, uh, at a course of, uh, or in a course of this kind. Uh, but I think uh, it is essential to go through to understand some very uh, basic fundamentals. So, let us uh, define what is separation. Now, in very simple terms uh, separation can be termed as a reverse procedure of mixing. You can uh, or if, if you want you can call it as unmixing. Those operations which transform a mixture of substances into two or more products which differ from one another in composition that is what the act of separation is. And when do we require separation? Well, you may have a mixture to start with for example, you have a crude which is naturally occurring substance and you find that only certain fractions of that can be utilized in uh, certain ways. So, you would like to do the fractionation. So, you may take help of distillation or when you transform molecules you carry out reactions. So, it is not only the main reaction which occurs there are side reactions, series reactions, parallel reactions and finally, you end up with a mixture of uh, species out of which only selected species may be of importance or may be of more importance than others and you would like to separate them out. So, again separation uh, schemes or separation trains normally are found next to the uh, reaction scheme. So, idea is that minimum two or may be more than two species need to be separated. They are either naturally occurring in the form of a mixture or by carrying out reactions we would have created mixtures. Let us quickly uh, look at uh, one statement which tries to characterize the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics can be put in various forms. This is one way to state the second law of thermodynamics. It says all natural processes take place so as to increase the entropy and entropy here is a measure of the randomness. So, increase the entropy or randomness of the universe. Now, mixing as we know causes an increase in entropy and simple way to understand is that if I gave you one cup of uh, benzene uh, and one cup of toluene and if you uh, let us say draw a sample from uh, the benzene cup you are 100 percent sure that all molecules are of benzene. You took a sample from the toluene cup and you are 100 percent sure that all molecules are of toluene. But if I mix the two and mixing hardly takes any effort. So, with minimal effort I can mix the two and then I ask you to take the sample out 
the probability immediately has gone down to 50 percent. It is 50 percent probability that the molecules you have they belong to benzene cup or they belong to toluene cup. So, what does that mean that by mixing randomness has increased and if randomness has increased which means entropy has increased. Now, we defined separation as unmixing. So, mixing was very easy, but now unmixing is to be done. So, if I was given a 50 50 mixture of benzene and toluene and if I have to recover all the molecules of benzene and all the molecules of toluene, I require to do some additional work, some external work and that is the work of separation. Of course, there is a minimum thermodynamic work of separation which can be calculated for the given composition and given operating conditions, temperature and pressure conditions. But then the efficiency of separation comes into picture and that defines how much is the total work you are going to put into the system. It turns out that distillation utilizes a very small fraction of the work which is put into the system. Inherently distillation is an inefficient process and it will become clear when we go through some of the slides. So, separation therefore, into products of different compositions requires a process where minimum or equivalent to thermodynamic work must be supplied to cause a separation to occur because it is unmixing and without work it cannot be done. Another aspect of uh, separation, uh, any separation, it is applicable to any separation is that separation operations are interphase mass transfer processes. So, when we say interphase which means more than one phase is there. So, if you have a single phase and all the constituents are residing in that phase and you want to separate them out, one way to separate them out is to create another phase. So, if I have liquid and if I add thermal energy and partially vaporize, so I am creating another phase which is the vapor phase. Vapor phase is in contact with the liquid phase and that should then enable me certain amount of separation. If I have a liquid which is brought in contact with another liquid which normally we call as solvent and then distribution of species occurs, the, uh, the solvent does not mix with the other uh, or, or with the original liquid that again will cause separation. You can have uh, distillation, you can have extraction, you can have absorption, you can have stripping, all these operations essentially are two phase operations, sometimes even three phase operations. So, presence of an additional phase is required. Now, in distillation the addition is of thermal energy. So, it is the thermal energy which is going to provide the minimum thermodynamic work of separation. Now, if thermal energy is going to do the work of separation and thermal energy is conserved which means that energy in terms of kilocalories which you are putting into the system at certain level that must be recovered at the other end. So, we supply heat at a higher temperature which is in the reboiler, we recover almost the same amount of heat at a lower temperature in the condenser and it is the degradation of the level of thermal energy which is responsible for the separation of the species. In terms of quantum, in terms of kilocalories, you really do not lose any. Suppose, if I had a closed boiling system where the condenser temperature and the uh, reboiler temperature were more or less identical, feed was saturated. So, the enthalpy of feed will very nicely balance with the enthalpy of the top and bottom products put together, which means the reboiler load and the condenser loads will be almost identical. So, if I am putting 1 million kilocalories in reboiler, I would have recovered 1 million kilocalories in the condenser. So, quantum of energy is not doing anything, it is the level of energy which is doing the work of separation. I put energy let us say at 120 degree Celsius in reboiler and I may be removing 
at 100 degree Celsius. So, 20 degree degradation would have occurred or maybe more if it is a white boiling system. So, let us now start constructing a separation system by taking this example. So, I have taken benzene and toluene which is close to an ideal system. You can start with any composition may be 50 50. The uh, circle with uh, arrow shows here that there is a provision for heat transfer it may be in or it may be out and uh, a valve here shows that you can do throttling, you can change the pressure if you if you like. So, if I have let us say uh, a liquid phase, if I have benzene and toluene given to me in liquid phase, I can create vapor phase by adding certain amount of thermal energy partial vaporization. I can also if, if the pressure was high, high to start with, I can also do certain amount of throttling and uh, throttling can also give vaporization or I can have a combination of the two. So, this is not important what we are doing here, what is important is that we should create another phase which should be in touch with the original phase. So, if original phase was liquid, I would like to create the vapor phase or vice versa. If I had vapor to start with, I can remove the energy and do certain amount of condensation and create a liquid phase that is the idea. Now, here comes the question of how does the separation occur? Well, the separation occurs because of the physical properties which different species have. We know that between benzene and toluene, benzene is more volatile. It is more volatile it simply means that its vapor pressure or the net vapor pressure which is exerted by this particular species in the mixture is higher than what is exerted by toluene. And therefore, we say that the ratio of two vapor pressures here because I said the system is of more or less ideal. So, it is simply ratio of two vapor pressures which becomes a factor of separation relative volatility as we call it. So, if it is greater than 1, we know that vapor will be richer in benzene and liquid will be richer in toluene. So, that is the underlying principle. So, this is a similar uh, uh, arrangement, uh, the, the feed condition could have been vapor, uh, it is not written here, it should have been written. Both the diagrams essentially mean the same thing here. All right. So, we did something to the feed and we created a vapor stream and a liquid stream and as I said vapor is richer in benzene, this is richer in toluene. Now, if I need to further carry out separation, uh, I should again do certain amount of heat transfer, but this heat transfer will be in the negative direction because this is vapor and I want to create a liquid phase. So, I will remove certain amount of energy. If I remove certain amount of energy, I would have created again another vapor phase which is in equilibrium with the liquid phase. And if I compare this vapor which is uh, characterized by the mole fraction y b prime, this is richer than this in benzene. And again the same argument applies that if I compare these two within, then this is richer in benzene and this is richer in toluene comparatively speaking here. I can continue to do that without focusing attention on uh, x b and x b prime. So, if my focus is on this particular stream which is rising up in the form of vapor. So, I have uh, some uh, improvement in the composition of benzene as compared to uh, what I started with, then I have further improved it and I can go on and on. So, I can come here and I can go on increasing the purity of benzene. What is shown here, this is a, uh, this is a multi stage uh, flash operation you can call it, where we are taking uh, the stream here it so happens that it is in vapor phase, certain amount of energy is removed, only partial condensation is done. So, I got another vapor stream and I continue to do that 
till the time I have the desired purity. So maybe if alpha is fairly good, let us say 1.5, 1.7 or maybe higher, finite number of stages, a few number of stages if I put this way, I probably will come to a point that benzene will be maybe 99 percent pure here. But if I look at the value of V n which is uh, the flow rate, that flow rate will be a very small fraction of what I started with because on the way I have left so many streams which are going different ways. So, recovery of benzene, recovery of benzene from the feedstock is very small. So, where is the benzene gone? Composition is very good 99 percent, but where is the benzene gone? Obviously, the benzene is still sitting into these streams. It is sitting in L n, L n minus 1 all the way up to L naught. All right. So, this is one thing we will have to keep in mind. The second thing is suppose these stages I am just giving a typical number. Let us say for a benzene toluene system this uh, uh, number of uh, flash uh, uh, units I have 10. 10 is a reasonable number. So, I have, I have uh, 10 uh, heat transfer devices. So, can I do something better? Can I do something better so that I improve the recovery of my benzene at the same time I cut down on the number of heat transfer devices? Well, so we start from this angle, uh, this side rather. Now, here if this is my final product, I need to keep this heat exchanger which is removing the energy because otherwise this product will not be in equilibrium with the liquid here. Because the purpose of this was to create two phases, two phases only will give me the desired separation. Phase uh, uh, has to be created for separation, we said that is something very fundamental about separation. Coming back to this particular heat exchanger, now what I am going to do is I am going to remove it. The purpose of this was to cause condensation. So, if I remove I must do something so that I still cause condensation. So, how, how can I cause condensation and not have this exchanger in place? Well, it is not difficult because if I, I have not written the temperatures here because we are only working with uh, these notation values. So, absolute numbers we do not know, but one thing is true that the temperature of this vessel will be lower than the temperature of this vessel. Why? Because energy has been re removed and there is a finite relative volatility. So, this vessel is cooler, this vessel is cooler than this vessel, which means this liquid is cooler than the temperature which is there in this vessel. So, if I take this liquid and revert it on this side, vapor of higher temperature is going to mix with liquid of lower temperature, vapor of higher temperature because this temperature is higher is going to mix with liquid of lower temperature and this mixing is going to cause condensation. Why? Because this vapor is at its dew point. This vapor is at its dew point. So, it is going to cause condensation. So, what is the claim? The claim is that even if I do not have this heat exchanger which is uh, heat removal unit, if I revert this stream and put it back into this flash vessel the mixing operation here is going to give me presence of liquid phase. Certain amount of condensation has to occur because this is cooler, L n is cooler than V n, v n minus 1. So, if that argument holds, I can continue to do that, I can remove the heat exchanger which was present let us say in, in uh, V n minus 3 stream here which is not shown and L n minus 1 I can revert back and I can cause condensation. So, by reverting all these streams to the adjacent flash vessel I can cause condensation 
and that is precisely I, I would like to do. On the other side the story is similar except that we have to remember that here we are removing energy, here we are going to add energy because this is liquid to start with and this is liquid at its bubble point. So, I need to add certain amount of energy so that I get vaporization, partial vaporization I have to do. So, this liquid is richer in toluene as compared to this one. I add more energy, I do further vaporization and I still improve the composition and I will come to a point with another few stages so that here the toluene is 99 percent or more whatever may be required. I do require this reboiler because this is the one which is doing vaporization. Now, this one is warmer than this one and therefore, if I get rid of this heater or reboiler and revert this stream back into this vessel because this is warmer, this is going to cause certain amount of vaporization and this vapor will partly get condensed. So, the same thing will happen here which means by reverting the vapor to the neighboring flash vessel, I will be able to cause vaporization. Here I was causing condensation. So, one thing we have very nicely achieved that we have improved the, uh, the, uh, the recovery of our both the constituents because these streams have been put back into the system and therefore, they have become the local recycles. Same is true here, we have also gotten rid of these coolers and these heaters except this has to be kept and this has to be kept. But we have done lot of damage from thermodynamics viewpoint. What is the damage we have done to the system? Anyone? Every time I am reverting the stream to the neighboring vessel, I am causing mixing and I know mixing is irreversible. Mixing increases the entropy and because so many times I am causing separation and then mixing separation and mixing and it is because of this frequent mixing which is occurring inside that my thermodynamic efficiencies are going down. So, thermodynamically this way of causing separation is not an efficient way. I know that I am causing uh, irreversibility in the system by carrying out the operation of mixing. But on the other side I do have a gain, the gain is that uh, my recoveries have gone up. So, I have recovered most of my benzene here, most of my toluene here and at the same time I am not working with too many heat exchangers. I have removed all those units. So, capital investment has gone down. The irreversibility here will show up finally in the operating expenditure because the heat loads on these units will go up. So, this is how we will have the separation process finally and uh, this becomes now a cascade of uh, uh, flash vessels. The cascade on this side is typically called the rectification zone because the focus is on the more volatile component here and on this side is your stripping zone. So, if I were to represent this in the form of a single piece of equipment with these things becoming internals, this will become a distillation column, this is the condenser for the column and this is the reboiler for the column. So, this is how a typical column looks like. Now, rather than having simple flash vessels, when I say flash vessel, flash vessel is expected to have fairly large residence time so that equilibrium could be attained. In distillation column you cannot afford to have so much of hold up so that your uh, residence times are large and therefore, you need some mechanism to enhance heat and mass transfer 
and therefore the internals will be required. You need a mechanism so that the vapor spends sufficient time with the liquid so that heat and mass transfer occurs. So, internals will be required. So, you may use trays, you may use packed uh, packings, but some internals will be required. But essentially the main column really works like a cascade of flashes. This is the uh, uh, final condenser on in which we were uh, removing the energy. The cascade which I constructed, I had done only partial condensation and therefore, I had uh, removed distillate as a vapor. Here, if we are going to send the product to storage, there is need to further condense it. So, you will do total condensation, rest of the process remains the same and therefore, uh, if it is uh, a distillation column with a total condenser, the way it is shown here, all of us know that condenser becomes only a heat transfer piece of equipment and there is no vapor liquid equilibrium here. Even when you study binary distillation, this is one thing which is told always that condenser is uh, not a theoretical stage, whereas the partial reboiler is a theoretical stage. Because the product when it is drawn from here, uh, this, this particular product here, this is in equilibrium with the vapor and the vapor is returned here. So, it is an equilibrium stage. Had it been partial condenser where I would have drawn the product, distillate product in the form of vapor from here and the liquid would have been refluxed, then this also will become a theoretical stage. So, the cascade I had shown was for a partial condenser. What I show here because this is how typically a column is configured this is with a total condenser. Of course, uh, when you carry out operation of this type and this is a vertical column, so you have to worry about uh, the liquid which is going to be there on uh, internals on trays. Uh, so, there will be a hold up. Uh, so, there will be a static head and if there is a static head, there will be a pressure drop across the column and then uh, the vapor has to have uh, uh, certain pressure drop from this side to other side because it will face uh, the internal resistance while traveling. Uh, so, uh, a real world column will always have uh, a pressure profile. So, we have to worry about that. Then the location of these pieces of equipment, this is only a schematic. Uh, the the condenser may be sitting at a different grade level here. So, you may want to uh, bring this reflux back on the top tray and because of the uh, static head again you may require a pump and if pump is required then you do not want this liquid to be at its bubble point. So, a certain amount of sub cooling has to be there and uh, so pressure is raised uh, beyond what is required in the column and for control purposes and at the same time for manipulation of pressure, you may require valves. So, all these accessories will come into picture, but theory wise a distillation column is nothing but a counter current cascade of flash vessels the way I depicted in the earlier slide. Now, that is good enough for us to understand the basic concept behind the uh, unit operation which is typically called distillation. But it does not end there because uh, there are various uh, ways columns are configured and uh, multi component systems may have uh, uh, variety of other pieces of equipment or uh, devices you, you may say that it may not be equipment attached to a basic distillation column. So, we should try to understand uh, what is normally involved or what is that you come across in industry when we primarily work with refineries and petrochemicals. As I said that is where the distillation columns normally dominate. So, some examples of complex columns could be the crude distillation column or sometimes it is called the atmospheric column which operates in a refinery typical refinery. 
then associated with crude column or subsequent to crude column you have uh, vacuum distillation column. Uh, sometimes it is operated in dry mode, dry mode means without presence of steam or it could be wet operation, uh, so steam is added or as I was telling you in the beginning that uh, distillation columns may follow uh, reactors. So, very good example is the FCC fractionator which of course is always sitting next to the FCC. The fluidized catalytic cracker because cracking gives you uh, a multi component uh, system, uh, continuous boiling system and that needs to be fractionated. And in many cases the FCC fractionator more or less resembles a crude distillation column. Similarly, uh, in refineries uh, you may have a need to uh, reduce the viscosity of uh, heavy feed stock and uh, you may do thermal cracking. Uh, the unit typically is called whisk breaker because the focus is on reduction of viscosity by thermal cracking and then because cracking is occurring uh, you, you get uh, a mixture of uh, li uh, lighter products and you may want to fractionate and recover useful products. So, such a distillation column will then be called a whisk breaker fractionator. Demethanizers again are uh, quite uh, complex columns, uh, they are found in refineries as well as in many petrochemical complexes. Uh, then you have these related operations like columns where uh, uh, azeotropes are being separated, so azeotropic distillation or extractive distillation or reactive distillation and so on and so forth. So, all these will fall under the category of what we call as complex columns. What I constructed in front of you was a simple column, a conventional simple column where there was one feed, one top product, one bottom product, condenser on the top and reboiler at the bottom. So, that is a simple column. So, this is one uh, simple example of a complex column. This column is not too complex, but yes, uh, if I compare this with the cascade which we constructed, it is complex. Now, you can see here that there are uh, theoretical stages shown here which are numbered 2 to 21 and since I am withdrawing uh, vapor as one of the products, so uh, condenser followed by this uh, reflux drum as it is called also is shown. So, this together also forms a theoretical stage because they are taking part in equilibrium, vapor liquid equilibrium. So, numbering is starting from here. There is no reboiler here. So, you may wonder what is the source of thermal energy. Well, the source of thermal energy is the stripping steam. So, thermal energy can come from an external source also. So, in such a case, when external source is used to provide the required thermal energy or let us say if its presence can change the performance of such a unit. For example, steam does not mix with hydrocarbons and if it, if it is fed to the column in superheated form. So, what happens is it remains in the vapor phase and therefore, the hydrocarbons then start distilling at their partial pressure and as the pressure goes down the volatilities improve and separation improves. So, steam could have multiple functions, it becomes a source of thermal energy, it also adds to improvement of the separation factor. So, we see here that there is no reboiler, but stripping steam is there, there is a feed, we, we had a feed earlier, in fact we have two feeds here, so you can say it is a multiple feed column. So, two hydrocarbon feeds or maybe main feeds, one uh, steam feed which is the, uh, uh, we can call this as a mass separating agent, uh, that is the term for normally used uh, mass separating agent. There is provision for uh, withdrawing a product which is in liquid phase at certain level, so it is called the liquid side draw. There is provision here to withdraw a vapor side draw, so this is another desired product of certain composition. There is yet another feed coming, so we have three, three feeds and one mass separating agent, no reboiler, two side draws, one is liquid, one is vapor. We also have provision to 
uh, remove certain amount of energy from within the column and uh, re return the, uh, the cooled uh, stream back into uh, the column. Uh, this is very typical of refinery columns where uh, the products when they are drawn uh, in large amounts they create imbalance in the vapor liquid internal traffic and therefore uh, you have to do something to balance the traffic and one way to balance the traffic is to uh, remove certain amount of energy uh, let us say from the liquid and return uh, a subcooled liquid and this subcooled liquid then uh, tries to condense it uh, tr uh, tries to condense uh, part of the vapor and uh, you generate internal refluxes and you try to balance uh, uh, liquid and vapor traffic uh, inside the column. And these are typically called uh, pump arounds in refineries. So, these pump arounds are present, pump arounds are uh, ways and means to balance internal traffic. They also uh, um, become uh, uh, you can say useful uh, entities for uh, removal of uh, thermal energy at higher temperature and uh, this energy uh, which may be available at temperatures of the order of 250 degrees Celsius or 300 degrees Celsius can then be used very effectively to do uh, preheating uh, of uh, cold streams in the plant. So, we are not getting into those kind of things right now, but when I look at this distillation column I do have a condenser. I have liquid side draw right from the top. So, it is a it is a complex condenser it does not only have a vapor product it also has a liquid product. There is provision for decanted water. So, maybe there is occurrence of three phases here. So, the thermodynamics comes into picture we have to worry about the thermodynamic aspects. I have the two pump arounds and multiple feeds and couple of side draws for products and a mass separating agent and no reboiler at the bottom. So, this column looks very different as compared to what we had configured. So, the thing is where do we start? If modeling is to be done where do we start? Well, because we come across very complex situations such as this, this of course, as I said is not too complex, I can make columns much more complex than this. So, we start with uh, a sort of uh, uh, configuration which makes provision for everything to happen uh, which is shown on the diagram. So, most general model for a distillation system is what we are interested, uh, interested in and then model re reduction can be done to configure simple columns that is the whole idea. Now, uh, I am not spending time on uh, uh, various aspects of uh, column internals this couple of slides just to show you that uh, ultimately because the hold ups are small residence times are small, but we operate with the assumption that vapor and liquid will attain equilibrium or at least near equilibrium. Uh, therefore, we want some mechanism so that heat and mass transfer rates are kept high so that we get good separations. So, variety of internals are used if they are small columns random packings are used large diameter columns trays will be used different types of trays uh, are used in industry uh, structured packings are used sometimes in columns combinations are used part of the column may have uh, tray part of the column may have um, packing and among the trays three most popular types which we encounter in petroleum and petrochemical industry are the simplest which is the sieve tray which simply has uh, holes of uh, certain diameter hundreds and thousands of holes on each tray or the bubble cap trays which are which have this kind of mechanism where the vapor can come from beneath and then across the surface there are tiny tiny holes and the, the vapor will emerge from, from the side and this whole thing will be embedded inside the liquid pool. So, that vapor will be bubbled through uh, through this cap. So, it is called the bubble cap and there will be hundreds of such caps on a single tray or uh, uh, a valve tray in which 
there is a moving mechanism this is a fixed ray this also is a fixed ray so no no item is moving here but here there is a valve so if vapor flow rate goes down this valve goes down because the location of or the position of this valve depends upon the uh, hydrodynamic balance uh, which occurs uh, on this particular unit so if the vapor comes with high velocity the the valve fully opens and then it has a locking device it can't come out but if the vapor velocities go down then the valve will go down so more like uh, uh, a rotameter in which you know the float balances itself depending upon the hydrodynamics so these are the three types and again there will be hundreds of valves on a given tray uh, so uh, these are the three types which we normal normally use in industry in addition you have structured packings and both of them can be successfully used uh, if you have large diameter columns and small diameter columns even random packings can be uh.